Welcome to the video lecture for chapter two on uh, numerical descriptors. In this chapter, we're going to focus mostly on um, what's referred to as measures of central tendency. Um, central tendency being the middleness of a distribution of a data set. In other words, uh, the average or the mean and the median, for example. And these are very important um, initial yet very basic descriptions of the, the distribution of a data set. We're going to see later on in the course that <clears throat> the average or the mean is the most basic statistic we can calculate for a, a data set and most um, statistical analyses that we will use for various purposes with data sets rely on the statistical average or the statistical mean, the most common measure of central tendency. Okay, <clears throat> so in this chapter, as I said, we're going to deal with the measure of the central tendency, which is the mean and also the median. We'll see the difference in those in a minute. Um, measures of spread. In other words, how much variation on either side of the mean do we have in the data set? Uh, we're going to look at what's called the five number summary, which is a way to sort of quantify that spread. Uh, we're going to look at how we deal with outliers, which we sort of hit on a little bit in the first chapter. And then... Um, choosing among the various summary statistics given the data set that we have. All right, so let's talk about the mean or arithmetic average first. Uh, one thing I wanna mention real quick, in the PowerPoint, um, the figure or the uh, formulas rather show up just fine. When I bring the PowerPoints up in um, my iPad, you'll see that it leaves out things. I had to write in the plus signs and the summation sign, for example. So that's just my handwriting. Don't worry about it. The, these uh, formulas are correct. Okay, so if we want to calculate, let me write this in, if we want to calculate the average or the mean of a data set, um, it's very, very simple. All we have to do is add up all the individual numbers or data points and divide by how many data points there are. So for example, if we had uh, 10 data points in a data set, okay, 10 numbers in a column, for example, in a spreadsheet, we simply add up those numbers, get our total, and divide by 10. That gives you the mean. And so that's what we're doing right here. So our mean, which is x bar, x with bar over top, is data point one plus data point two, and so on down the line for however many data points we have, divided by n, which is our sample size, the number of data points. Um, now, you very often don't see these sorts of statistics expressed this way in statistical textbooks. What you see is statistical notation here, and this can be a little bit confusing for students. Sometimes students have a hard time kind of getting around this, but once you learn how to read it, it makes perfect sense. So we just talked about how to calculate the average. This formula is summarizing that very procedure. So all we do is take each individual measurement and add them all up. This is the, the Greek letter epsilon. It's the summation sign. It just means to add, okay? It's not saying calculus or anything like that. This is just saying to add. We add up each individual data set, or data point rather, and we multiply that by 1 over n. When you multiply a number by 1 over n, you're dividing that number by n. So this times 1 is this divided by n. So add up our numbers and our data set and divide by how many numbers we have, that gives you the mean. Okay, it's as simple as that. So don't let you know, this rather complex looking formula scare you off. It's just saying, do this, all right? Okay, so let's look at an example here. So that was the average. Let's look at an example of another way that you can calculate the uh, central tendency of a data set, what's called the median. Now, the median is simple. The median is simply the middle data point of a distribution. Uh, it's the number for which half the observations lie above and half the observations lie below. So, what you always want to do, first of all, when you're trying to figure out the median, is sort your data points, right? You want to sort your data set from smallest number to largest number. And Excel spreadsheets, or really any spreadsheets, will, will, will do this very, very easily with one simple command, typically. Um, the median is located at 
n plus 1 divided by 2. So you take your sample size, add 1 to it, divide that number by 2, and that tells you which data point in the sorted list is the median. So for example, let's say here on the left we have a data set with 25 data points. All right, n equals 25, so n plus 1, 26, divided by 2, equals 13. That means our median is data point number 13, 3.4. 13 is not the median. That's the identifier of the data point 3.4 that is the median. That is the middle data point in this row of numbers or column of numbers. Now, that's what you do if you have an odd sample size. So 25, for example, that's an odd number. What if your sample size is an even number, say 24? All right. Well, again, n plus 1 divided by 2. So 24 plus 1 is 25 divided by 2, 12.5. Well, there is no number 12.5 here. You have 12 and 13. So the median is the average of these two numbers. It's the average of data point 12 and data point 13. So 3.3 plus 3.4 divided by 2, 3.35. So 3.35 would be right in the middle of these two, right? And so that's how you calculate the median in a situation where you have an even number of data points. Okay, So you should remember those, those two formulas, or those two ways of calculating median, rather. All right, <clears throat> so let's look at uh, a comparison of the mean and the median and talk about why it is we would ever want to calculate the median if you can calculate the mean instead. Well, the answer to that is that the median is resistant to skew and outliers. The median value is not affected by skew or outliers. Um, remember, skew on a distribution is when you have one tail that's sort of extended out to the right uh, or above the mean or to the left below the mean. It gives you a, an asymmetrical, um, uneven distribution. Now, in a case where you have a symmetrical distribution, like a normal curve here, for example, as it's called, the mean and the median will both be smack in the middle, and they'll both be the same. They will equal each other in a symmetrical distribution. But if we have a distribution that is left skewed, you see this long tail coming off to the left, the mean will get pulled in the direction of the skew. So if you have two numbers here, and you're asked which is the mean and which is the median, the mean is the one being pulled in the direction of the skew. The median will be the one on the other side of it. In a case of right skew, the mean is pulled to the right, so this is going to be your mean, and the number here on the left will be the median. The reason for that is because in calculating the mean, the value of each data point is figured into the calculation. So extreme data points would pull the mean in their direction. For the median, you're just identifying the middle number in a data set and that doesn't care what the value of those individual data points or numbers are. You're just calculating the middle number. And so the median is not mathematically affected by skew or outliers. All right, that means that if you have a skewed data set, the median is probably going to be a better, more appropriate, more accurate representation of the middleness of that data set. If, however, you have a symmetrical distribution like what we have right here, the mean is always what you want to use. Okay, let's look at some examples. So uh, here we have a distribution for years until death after diagnosis with some disease, disease X. So we have years until death. We have a histogram showing you, um, you know, basically the number of people that survived, say, one to two years, two to three years, three to four years, and so on. And you can see that it looks pretty symmetrical for the most part. If you draw sort of a smooth curve on that, it would be symmetrical. So here, you calculate the mean, you find it's 3.4. You look at the data set, identify the middle number, the median, you see it's also 3.4. That's because there's no skew or outliers in that data set. The mean and the median are going to be the same in that case. Now, here we have a second plot of a different data set, years until death after diagnosis with multiple myeloma, a type of cancer. Here you can see that, that most people survived you know, less than one to two years. A few survived upwards of 13 or 14 years. So we have, obviously, a skewed data set being pulled to the right. So our mean is 3.4, but 
but the median is 2.5. So your, your average is right in here, but your median, your middle number, is in here. So the, the average is being pulled to the right because of that right skewed tail. All right, <clears throat> now let's talk about some measures of spread. When I say spread, I mean variation around the mean. How wide is the x-axis in a distribution or a histogram, okay? So um, there's a very common way to do this, and that's called standard deviation, and we'll get to that in a little bit. But first, let's talk about um, the use of what are called quartiles, all right? So quartiles are basically a way to break a data set up into fourths, hence the term quartile, right, one-fourth. Okay, so what we're going to do is figure out what's called quartile one and quartile three. All right, quartile one is the median of the values below the median in a sorted data set. So let's go back to our data set we showed before. We have 25 data points. We said that, okay, n plus one divided by two. 25 plus 1 is 26, divided by 2, 13. So data point number 13 is our median, 3.4. All right, now to figure out quartile 1, we want to figure out the mean, or the median rather, of these 12 data points, the data points below the median of the entire data set. So we have 12 data points here. Add 1 to that, and you get 13. 13 divided by 2. 6.5. We don't have a 6.5, we have a 6 and a 7, so we take the average of 6 and 7 data points, 2.1, 2.3, and we get a first quartile of 2.2. So 2.2 is simply the median of the numbers below the median of the entire data set. Quartile 3 here is the same thing, just the opposite side of the data set median. It's the median of the values above the median of the entire data set. So <clears throat> again, we find the median of these data points, and we find it's 4.35, so right in there, all right? That's Q3. So we've now found the median of the entire data set, right? We found Q1 and Q3, and basically divide our data set up into fourths. Okay, so let's look at an example. So here we have a data set um, looking at laboratory data on how fast skin wounds in uh, newts heal, okay? So here are the skin healing rate data for 18 newts measured in micrometers per hour. So we have our data set here. First thing you wanna do is sort it from low to high into this data set. So now we have our sorted data set here, okay? And we know we have 18 newts. So we want to find the median of that data set. Well, n plus 1 divided by 2, 18 plus 1 divided by 2 is going to equal 26.5. All right, so n plus 1 divided by 2, 19 divided by 2, 26.5, or the midpoint of values 9 and 10. So let's take a look. We know 26.5 um, <clears throat> is going to be right here, okay? So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. There's 9. There's 10, all right? Um, let me go back. I, I misspoke. n plus 1 divided by 2, 19 divided by 2 is not 26.5, okay? 19 divided by 2 is 9.5. So 9.5 would fit right here. This is data point 9. That's data point 10. 9.5 is right there. So 26.5 is our median, okay? All right, now quartiles. So we just found that our median is right there. So now we need to find for Q1, the median of these data points here. So 11 through 26. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. N plus one, nine plus one is 10 divided by two, is five, so data point five. One, two, three, four, five, right there. All right, so we have Q1 being 22, right? And then now we need to find Q3, which is gonna be the median of, of data points 27 through 40. So 
one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Again, we have nine data points there. So n plus one is 10. Number five, one, two, three, four, oops, sorry, one, two, three, four, five, right there. So 33 is going to be Q3, all right? So there we have Q1, and here we have Q2, or I'm sorry, Q3, with our median of our data set in the middle. Okay. Um, and you look on the dot plot here, and you see that this, uh, this seems to make sense, right? I mean, if you looked at the range of values from 11 all the way up to 40, you would sort of, if you did this in your mind's eye, estimate that uh, your median is going to be, you know, somewhere right in here, okay, the middle number, and it is. Um, I'm sorry, it's going to be right in here, the middle number, and then Q1 is going to be right around here, and Q3 right around here, okay? So again, this is just a way to sort of organize the data and to begin to describe the distribution in terms of how much variation we have around the middleness of that uh, distribution, whether we use you know average or mean as a measure of middleness or the median. All right, now let's talk about a much more common way of describing the middle middleness or central tendency of a data set. And this is what's known as the standard deviation. All right, <clears throat> and you're going to see this a lot throughout you know, the rest of, of this course. Probably in every single chapter we'll talk about it. Uh, so it's a good idea to really get a good handle on this and understand how to calculate it. And the calculation of it is actually pretty straightforward, even though you know, looking at these formulas, formula, it looks pretty complicated. It actually isn't. Okay, so in order to calculate the standard deviation, which is... S. Okay, S is our standard deviation. We first have to calculate what's called the variance, or S squared. All right, what are we doing here? Well, we have our statistical notation, which again looks very complicated, but you just have to reason through it. Again, we know this is our summation sign. It just means to add. All right, what are we adding? We're going to add what are called the deviations squared. All right, so X bar is our sample uh, uh, mean, our average, right? The average of our data set, X bar. X sub i is each individual data point in that data set. So for each individual data point, we subtract the average of the data set from it. This tells us how far that data point lies from the mean. It's called a deviation or a difference. We then, for that deviation for that data point, square it. And that gives us a squared deviation. So this is one number for each of our data points. So if we had 10 data points, we would do this 10 times, once for each data point, and we'd end up with a squared deviation for each data point. Then we simply add those up and get the sum of the squared deviations. That's what this term in the formula is, sum of squared deviations. We then divide that by our sample size minus one. So if we had 10 data points, we would divide the sum of squared deviations by nine. That gives us the variance. But that's not the standard deviation. The standard deviation is one step further. <clears throat> we simply take the square root of the variance to get the standard deviation. So now we have the calculation we just did up here. This is our variance calculation. We get that number, the variance, and take the square root of it. That gives us S, the standard deviation. All right. So this is pretty straightforward. We're gonna look at an example now with a real data set in terms of how to do this. All right, <clears throat> so let's read this. The pers person's metabolic rate is the rate at which the body consumes energy. Find the mean and standard deviation for the metabolic rates of a sample of seven men in kilocalories per 24 hours. All right, so here we have our individual metabolic rates in kilocalories per 24 hours, right? So we have a mean of 1,600, okay, mean of 1,600. Take all these data points, add them up, divide by 7, you get 1,600. That's our mean. We take each data point and subtract the mean from it. So 1,792 minus 1,600, 1,666 minus 1,600, and so on. And we get our deviations. Notice that some of our deviations are negative because in this case, the actual data point is smaller than the mean. It's on the left-hand side of the mean in our distribution. 
here, it's on the right hand side, so we get a positive number. All right, so you get negative and positive numbers for your deviations, and that's okay. Then we have to square those. We square our deviations. And so you see we have 192 as a deviation here. We square it, and we get 36,864. That's a squared deviation for our first data point. The reason for squaring is that it gets rid of these negative numbers, which can be problematic later on. So we square all of our deviations, and now we have our squared deviations. We then have to sum them, and we get 214,870. All right, so let's go over here to the calculation on the right. So again, we're going to take <coughs> um, our, our mean, right, which is simply adding up each individual value and dividing by our sample size. That gives us 1,600. Now we have to start calculating our sum of squared deviations, okay? So x sub i minus the mean squared for each data point right here, right? And we get our squared deviations, 214,870, right there, just by going this, through this process I talked about. Now, our degrees of freedom is n minus 1, sample size minus 1. We have 7 data points, so 7 minus 1 is 6, all right? So, <clears throat> as squared, our variance is going to be the sum of our squared deviations divided by n minus 1, or 6. We get 35,811.7. That's our variance. The standard deviation is the square root of the variance. So take the square root of 35811.7, 189.2. 2. Okay. All right. Now, this figure here is just showing you how each data point, for example, 1792, differs from the average of 1600. 1792, the first one, has a deviation of 192. Uh, the next one, Oops, nope, not that one. This one, 1439, right there, has a deviation of minus 161. That's just the distance that it lies from the average. So the standard deviation then is sort of summarizing these individual distances as a whole for the entire data set. And again, it's the most common uh, measure of deviation of data points around a mean that we use in statistics. And you find it in almost every single statistical analysis that we're going to talk about in this later parts of this course. Okay, now let's look at a graphical representation of uh, central tendency and deviation around the mean or the median. Uh, this is called a box plot, okay? So box plots are pretty common, you see them quite a bit. Um, they have their uses. There are some applications where they're fine. There are others where they're not what you'd want to use, but we'll talk about that a little bit later on. So let's say we have our data set here, <clears throat> okay? We can calculate something called the five-number summary. The five-number summary is defined as the minimum value of the data set. So the minimum value, quartile 1, the median, quartile 3, and the maximum value of our data set. With these five numbers, you can construct a box plot. In the box plot, what we have is our minimum value here, as this, the bottom of this little whisker, as it's called, or error bar. The bottom of the box itself is quartile one. The middle of the box is the median. The top of the box is quartile three. And the top of the top whisker, the maximum extent of the top whisker, is the maximum value of our data set. So the box plot <coughs> summarizes these five numbers. It is a graphical representation of our five number summary. All right. Okay, and we'll talk about how we can use box plots um, in a little bit, or starting next actually. One of the, the nicest things about box plots, the most useful aspects of them is that they can help you um, identify or see skew in your data set and outliers. Okay, <clears throat> so let's look at this data set here. This is one we looked at earlier, um, years until death with diagnosis of disease X, for example. All right, we, we talked about the fact that this is a symmetrical distribution, no apparent skew, mean and median should be the same. If you convert this data into a box plot, this is what you get. So notice that we have our mean, or I'm sorry, our median here, Q1, Q3, minimum value of the data set, maximum value which we'll look at here in terms of trying to find 
evidence of skew is the length of these whiskers or error bars. Here you see that they're about the same. That's indicating that you have a symmetrical data set. Now, in this example, um, where we had uh, years until death after diagnosis with the, the multiple myeloma, the cancer, it's wildly skewed, as you can see, right? So we have our minimum value, Q1, median, Q3, and then look how far up our maximum value is. That maximum value right there is this extreme outlier over here, or what appears to be an outlier anyway. But the skew is indicated by the extreme length of that whisker, how much longer it is compared to the whisker on the bottom. So that elongated whisker tells you that you've got asymmetry or skew in your data set, okay? All right, <clears throat> um, so that's what you want to look for, and that's really one of the most useful applications of box plots is that they're a really good way to get an idea of how much skew there is in your data set, okay? In addition to using, you know, a histogram or a frequency distribution like this, for example. Just an alternate way to look at the distribution. All right, now, I mentioned a minute ago that this appears to be an outlier, and we talked about outliers in Chapter 1. The question is, if you have an outlier, what do you do with it? Well, you could throw it out, but you have to, to, to make those kinds of decisions objectively. If you just throw out an outlier uh, because it makes your data look messy in terms of you know, a, a skewed distribution like this, then you are cherry picking your data and you're introducing your own personal biases into that data set. And in sciences, we cannot do that. We have to remain as objective as we possibly can in order for the evidence to be valid, whatever evidence we're finding for whatever it is we're studying. We cannot interject our own personal biases. So you are uh, interjecting your own personal biases if you just willy-nilly you know, throw a data point in the garbage can because you don't like the way it makes your distribution look. There are objective tests you can use to determine if that really is an outlier. If it's so unlikely to have occurred that it must be an outlier and you determine that to be so, then you can get rid of it, but you have to justify that. So we're going to talk about how you do that. Okay, <clears throat> so first of all, to do this, we have to um, identify what's called the interquartile range, the IQR. This is nothing more than the length of the box in a box plot. It's the distance between quartile 1 and quartile 3. Right? Quartile 1 is the bottom of the box. Quartile 3 is the top of the box. That is your interquartile range. An outlier is a data point that falls outside the overall pattern, as we've seen with a couple of histograms already. But the question is, how far outside that overall pattern does a value need to be for us to consider it a suspected outlier? Well, there's some general rules of thumb that you see right here, okay? A suspected low outlier is by and large any value that is less than Q1 minus one and a half times the IQR. So in this case, you would identify the IQR. You take Q3 and subtract Q1 from it. That gives you the IQR. You would multiply that by 1.5. Then subtract it from Q1. And that sets a lower threshold. If a low outlier falls below that lower threshold, and here's your lower threshold defined this way, right here, and a low outlier falls below it, then you can confidently call it an outlier and you can get rid of it if you wanted to. And no one could argue with you because you've applied an objective test to it. That is your objective test. What about a suspected high outlier? <clears throat> well, this is any value greater than Q3 plus one and a half times the IQR. So you find the IQR, length of your box in the box plot, multiply it by 1.5, add that to Q3, and that gives you an upper threshold. If your outlier falls above that, you can get rid of it. You can be confident that it's an outlier. So let's take a look at this. All right, so here we have a data set, <clears throat> and notice it's sorted from smallest to largest, okay? So we have our minimum value right there, or maximum value right there, okay? Well, actually, what they've done here is, is they've automatically assumed that this maximum value is 7.9 because it's so much larger than the next smallest value is an outlier. They've not used it to calculate the top of the top error bar. They've considered 5.6 as the top of that, and now we have a suspected outlier that falls so far above it, we're thinking it's an outlier, all right? We have Q1 as the bottom of the box. Here we have the median, and Q3 as the top of the box. Okay, so Q1 is 2.2, .2, Q3 
Q3 is 4.35, as you see calculated here and here. All right, our interquartile range is Q3 minus Q1, or 2.15. So we have the suspected outlier here, a value of 7.9. We need to see where it falls. <clears throat> Does it fall below, above that theoretical threshold? Is it a high outlier? Remember, we're looking for a value that falls above, um, in this case, Q3 plus 1.5 times the IQR. So our IQR is 2.15, right? <clears throat> so 2.15, let me get my calculator up and do this real quick. So 2.15, all right, as our <clears throat> um, IQR times 1.5, so 2.15 times 1.5 equals 3.225, right? And there you see it, okay? So that's our threshold. So 3.225. We need to add that then to Q3. So if Q3 is, as we see here, 4.35, so we add 4.35 to 3.225, so 4.35 added to 3.225, and we get, uh, we'll round it to 7.58, 7.58. This is actually our threshold, right? So 7.58 would fall about right there. And we see that 7.9, our suspected outlier, is above that. So we can confidently call 7.9 an outlier, and we could choose to get rid of it if we wanted to. Um, we just get rid of it because we've decided it's an outlier. <clears throat> okay. Objectively, we're okay doing that. Now, there might be some other considerations you might want to take into account to actually help you figure out whether or not you should get rid of that value. Okay. All right. Let's look at um, this example here. So here we have an anonymous class survey. Weight in pounds and height and in inches were used to compute body mass index. So we have a histogram for body mass index. We see some slight skew here, but we have this outlier. And that outlier is because we have a relatively small height, right? Um, this is actually the shortest height we have for men, but the greatest weight that we have for men. And so that's why we have such a large BMI in this case, right? And so we have a suspected outlier. Now, when you plug this data, this data set into a statistical software program like Minitab and tell it to do a box plot, it's automatically going to identify that value with an asterisk just to let you know that that's a suspected outlier. It also identified these values here as potential outliers as well, but then used this value as the maximum to calculate uh, your five number summary shown in the box plot. So we've got this value in particular we want to look at to see if it is um, an outlier. <clears throat> and you could do the IQR. Plus, I'm sorry, the uh, maximum value, um, I'm sorry, Q3 plus 1.5 times the IQR, that rule to figure out if that's um, an outlier. And judging by, you know, the distance here, yeah, that's going to be an outlier for sure. And <clears throat> you can get rid of it. Now the question is, you know, is there a way you can salvage that data point? Um, was there human error involved in recording information? Maybe you go back to your raw data sheets and you find the height for this person was actually not 60, but maybe it was 69 inches. Well, that would dramatically reduce the body mass index, pushing this number back this way and sort of correcting it. So maybe this is a typo, um, you know, some sort of error in data input. If you can correct that, then that's what you should definitely do rather than get, getting rid of a potentially valid data point. Um, now, it also could be that that data point is an unexplainable but apparently legitimate, you know, wild observation. So the question then becomes, you know, if this is the situation, are you interested in all individuals? Are you interested only in typical individuals? So maybe that turns out to be, you know, a valid data point, but maybe the scope of your study is sort of limiting you to, to looking at only typical individuals. So that might be, oops, sorry, that might be a valid reason for excluding that data point. If you can justify it based on you know, your study design or your study objectives, that's fine as well. 
The point is you can't just willy-nilly discard data points because they don't make your data um, look good or something like that. All right, okay. Now, let's kind of shift gears and talk about choosing among summary statistics. So we've talked about the mean and we've talked about the median primarily as our two uh, most common measures of central tendency. In what case might you want to use the mean versus the median? Well, we've already talked about the fact that the mean is not resistance to outliers or skews. It's, it's affected by those, right? The value of the mean is mathematically affected by outliers and skews. So when you have a data set that has no obvious outliers or skew, then you'd want to use the mean as your, me as your measure of central tendency. In that case, you could plot something like this, the mean plus and minus your standard deviation. So this distance here from the mean to the bottom of this whisker where error bar is one standard deviation, the, me the distance above he uh, the mean here is also one standard deviation. So the mean plus or minus one standard deviation. That's a very common way to summarize a normal data set, a non-skewed symmetrical data set. Now, what if you have a skewed data set? Then you want to use the median, five number summary, and a box plot. So box plots really are, are, are sort of reserved for looking at data sets or describing data sets that are skewed and where you have outliers. Um, otherwise, if you have a, a data set that's normally distributed, meaning no skew, and so it's symmetrical and no obvious outliers, use the mean plus and minus one standard deviation. All right, <clears throat> so let's look at an example here. Um, in this example, we're looking at deep sea sediments. So phytopigment concentrations in deep sea sediments, we're told, collected worldwide, show a very strong right skew. That's our key here. So we have two data points, uh, or two means rather, two values, 0 0.015 and 0 0.009. These are two measures of central tendency. Which of these two values is the mean and which is the median? Well, we have right skew, right? <clears throat> and because we know that skew pulls the mean in its direction, we know that if we plotted this on a histogram or used a box plot, we would see that the mean is pulled to the right, whereas the median would not be. So that means that this value here will be our average or mean being pulled to the right, and 0 0.009 would be our median, not affected by that right skew. So it would stay more to the left, okay? In this case, which of these two would be the better summary statistic? It's going to be the median because you know you've got the very strong right skew in your data set. And so that is sort of um, biasing the mean, the average, as an estimate of central tendency. You wouldn't want to use it in that case. You want to use the median. Okay. All right. One final example here before we finish up. Um, this is the example a data set we looked at in uh, chapter one when we were, we were talking about categorical uh, versus quantitative uh, variables. And so we have researchers having grafted human cancer cells on the 20 healthy adult mice. 10 of the mice were injected with tumor-specific antibodies, anti-CD47, uh, which should reduce cancer rates. And the other 10 mice were not uh, injected with the antibodies, the IgG group. Here's what a table of the raw data would look like. So our question here then is, what summary statistics would you use for each of these two variables? Well, variable one, presence of metastases, that's a categorical variable as we talked about. So here you compute, you could compute the count of mice with metastases, maybe you know 10 versus one, for example. Um, or the, por the proportion of mice with metastases, one versus 0.1 for each group. Because it's a categorical variable, you can't calculate uh, an average for it or a mean. All right. Now, number of metastases, that is a quantitative variable, right? We have individual numbers. So this mouse had three, this mouse had one, had one for example. Um, because it's a quantitative variable, you want to keep, compute the mean and the standard deviation of the number of metastases for each group, right? So, <coughs> um, in fact, what that turns out to be um, for this group, um, the IgG group, you have a uh, mean of 2.4 and a standard deviation of 0.97. So mean equals 
s equals 0 0.7, sorry, 0 0.97. And then for this group, you'd have a mean of 0 0.1 and a standard deviation of 0 0.32, okay? But you can use mean and standard deviation for this variable because it's a quantitative variable. You can't use that here. Here you'd have to use the proportion of uh, mice with metastases versus without metastases or something like that. Um, proportional data is very commonly used for categorical, proportional statistics, I should say, um, are very commonly used for categorical variables because you can't calculate an average based on yes and no, right? Okay, so that's it then for the uh, ch uh, chapter two on um, numerical descriptors of data sets.